basketball player with a big Afro paint on and I typed in like the name Mocha Choco and he's laughing so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I must have run insanely hard because I probably had no idea what I was doing, but Hey hey everyone. Today I, I am with my very first coach. And I think there's many players who can say the same. The man, the myth, the legend, Cogsis. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Oscars. Okay, let's start with, with the classic. How did you get into poker? Uh, it was like 2003. And I guess just sort of cruising the internet. And like I saw like the poker was sort of coming into the ether if you want like there was just more articles about it more poker sites popping up so i joined one of those sort of free sites where you could just play like play money tournaments and the prize at the end of the month for whoever got the most wins was like some sort of educational subscription thing that was probably worth about ten dollars a month i played like day and night to win that thing i was obsessed with it (laughs) I wanted to win it so badly. I don't know why. And then when I did win it, like I was emailing them, hey, I won. When do I get the subscription? Like like 30 seconds after I got the most points. And then I got the educational thing and it really was pretty shit. But still, I was was desperate to get it. I don't know why. And uh, yeah, so then I deposited $50. And I was just playing cash games and I, there was no idea about bankroll management or anything. I just had my whole $50 on the table every time I played. And I remember having my whole roll on there and I had like pocket jacks. I was all in pre and the flop comes down like ace, king, XX. And I was probably had like all in pre against like two other players. And then I just peeled this jack on the river to win the pot and sort of triple up my bankroll. And the other guys were like, oh my God, you're so lucky. Like you have no idea how far behind you were. So I guess it was possibly like one guy had like ace king or something like that. But yeah, it was like, it was a super, super lucky spot where if I didn't triple up my bankroll and lost the $50, I probably would have just quit and not started again. So yeah, I was like one card away from being out of poker. And then it turned into like a career and a, a lifestyle. All right. Sounds really good, but I don't think you could have not joined the game if you liked it in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I was always competitive, but everyone was giving me negative feedback at the time. Like, and in my head, poker was like negative. Like, it's just gambling. You're going to lose your money. All that sort of stuff. So that's why if I didn't run good early, I probably just wouldn't have got back into it. Yeah, there's, there's like, uh, previously, Mocha had. Uh, a lucky, lucky beginning. I think Jack had a lucky beginning. I think there is something to reel in. <laughs> yeah, it, it helps you, yeah, to, to get you involved and to maybe change your mindset about poker. Like, oh, maybe this thing is legit. But yeah, if I had an unlucky beginning, I probably would be, you know, still a teacher and like hating life. So yeah, I ran good. <laughs> That's good. All right. What is needed to stay in the game so long as you did? I think you. Yeah. You've been around for so many years and there is there is there has to be a secret. Yeah, I've been playing like fifteen years. Um, I think what helps is that I literally play every day. Like, I mean obviously in fifteen years you can have some days off. But in a typical month I'll play thirty days out of thirty days. But I don't play like too many hours. I play like maybe two, three, four hours a day and then go do my thing. So it's a little sort of task that I do in the morning, get it out of the way. And I've made enough money to live off, or hopefully it'd be nice to save some as well. But I'm not like crushing myself all day, every day and burning myself out. I'm like pacing myself like you're running a marathon, right? Not sprinting and like, you know, desperate to get to the end. And that way it doesn't feel like you're working. It's just like part of your routine. You wake up, you do three or four hours, maybe longer, and then you're good for the day and you enjoy your day. Yeah. I think I slowly start to take your habit. I think that I'm pacing a lot slower than I started out as well. And I think it's, yeah. it's something that helps for sure. What has yeah, been your biggest... Oh, yeah, go on. Yeah, otherwise you're going to burn yourself out. Like you can't go like eight, 10 hours a day every day. You're just going to be destroyed after six months or a year. 
Yeah, because it's such a challenging game and you need to be focused and it's like mentally draining if you do it for many years. Yeah. What has been your biggest challenge in your poker career? Um, like dealing with myself. I had a lot of, uh, I, I had a really rough childhood, like an extremely difficult childhood, which like few people know about. And those issues were giving me a lot of anger in poker. Like it, they, they, they would come out as sort of tilt and that sort of thing. And I worked with Jared Tendler. It didn't help me personally. And then I found Elliot Rowe back when everyone could afford Elliot, <laughs> back when he was cheap. <laughs> now he has, like he's a genius, but he has like an insanely high alley now and no one can really afford him unless you're a baller. But back when he was cheap, I was one of his first clients and all of that sort of horrible childhood, we dealt with it and it made me happier as a person and happier as a poker player. So now I just mostly play with that anger. Uh, like, like very, very occasionally I can get tilted, but I'm not like a Mills who's going to like throw his laptop or something like that or some other famous poker players who are just like, you know, you, you're sitting there and outside their room, like a chair comes flying out the door. It's like, <laughs> I'm pretty chill when I play these days. Shout out to Mills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Love him, but the boy does get a little bit upset. And the funniest thing is like, why would you get upset? Like you're tall, he does great with girls, he makes money, like he's successful, and he's just always perma-tilted. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, there is, there is the, every, everyone has their own issues and difficulties to deal with and and, sure. uh, I think we, we will get to Mills as well one day. <laughs> uh, there is something interesting I heard, and I see you again, and I see you on the stream with in this exact position. That is not a many players who grind in this laying down position. Yeah, Have you yeah. been in uh, this position forever, like grinding boys? I used to train jujitsu and a little bit of MMA. Um, I was terrible at it, but I loved it. And all that I ended up with from it was a shitty blue belt. My ears are, are um, cauliflowered up so that if you sort of touch them, they're like hard as a rock. And I had to have a back operation. Um, so they took out part of my spine and one of the discs because I just destroyed my back doing it. And ever since then, I can't sit. If I sit for like more than like 20 minutes, it's extremely uncomfortable. So this is the only option for me to sort of lie back and be in a reclined position when I grind. Otherwise, I couldn't do it. Like that's the good thing about poker is I can, I can do this lying on bed on my bed. But like if I had to have a real job, I probably physically couldn't do it because my back just couldn't handle it. Okay, yeah, I didn't know. That. I, I thought you'd just like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I like chilling as well. It's like cool, but like <laughs> no, it's basically so my back is fucked. It's the only option. So yeah, yeah I thought it's like, you might like it, but it's not good for focus. I think for me, it would be very hard to focus if I lay down and and play it. But I get you. I guess you get used to it. Yes, yeah, if it's the only option, then, take the only option. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Have you ever considered quitting poker? Um, I was a, a high school teacher and I did it for 10 years. And the joke I always make is I enjoyed it for about 10 minutes. Like <laughs> I couldn't stand getting dressed up, wearing a tie every day, going like the kids were great. I like the kids, but like dealing with, like I, I was a shitty teacher as well. So like the kids are not having that much fun and like they're bored in my class. I'm bored in my class. I just dreamed of getting out the whole time I was in it. And then when poker came along, I was like, all right, fine, I'm out. And that was insane. Like the, the only nightmares I ever have are when I'm still teaching. And it's not like anything bad is happening. I'm just in a classroom teaching and that is like a nightmare to me. And I'm not joking. I wake up going like, oh my God, that was terrible. Thank God it's not real. So I'm so happy not to be a teacher that like poker is like a dream for me and I'm very happy doing it. I'd like to make more money doing it, but like that's really on me. But yeah, like poker's awesome. All right. That yeah, sounds good. That's like, yeah, you left it as a an only option, then 
you don't consider yeah. quitting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't afford to quit. Like I haven't, like all of my net, my uh, my net worth got sort of uh, removed from me by my ex-wife. Like I had built up a decent, not not huge, but like I had a villa that was worth like maybe 300k US dollars. I had a piece of land that was worth like 50k. I had a car, and now I just have a little bit of debt, and my ex-wife has all of that. So my sort of future that I was building towards is gone. So now poker is the only option. And I'm, I'm too old to go get another job. I'm like almost 50, right? So you're not going to like restart a career uh, very frequently when you're at my age. It can be done, but like probably not very likely, right? Yeah, it's hard. I'm not like you, you, you're bad at poker. You're still, you're still in games and still going and still yeah. teaching, teaching and studying. That's... Yeah. yeah, I still make a living. And honestly, like, I have like about the highest win rate out of anybody at 25s. If I just put in like a lot more work, I'd make more money. I have an okay win rate at 50s. If I put in more work, I'd make a, you know, more money. And I'm starting to study GTO. Like I'm putting in hours to Lucid every day. Um, I had Hans look at my, my PT4, which I really appreciated, and like run all those reports for regs and fish. Like I'm working on getting better. I actually had a, um, a guy who played me I think, was he Polish or Hungarian? Like one of those regs. And he said, Cog, you're such a dinosaur. You're shit. Why don't you learn GTO, bro? He actually said that to me in the games like a week ago. And I was like, well, actually I am. Good point. I am. Then I said, what's, what's your uh, cheap EV? And he said like 52. I said, oh, fuck off. I've got 72. So, <laughs> But regardless, like he made a really good point like you can't be a dinosaur and expect to hang around right like the dinosaurs aren't with us anymore so got to improve and i'm working on it yeah that's good and i i'm pretty sure that you will learn quickly because the, you're not that far off as you think and and then and when you go into lucid drills then yeah they're really good i'm after, just smashing them out yeah after a couple of months there could be a cog this 2.0 I really hope so because like I've seen people that I've taught get good at GTO and just fly past me into higher stakes, right? Like um, when Hans looked at my, my, uh, my database, what he said was, and like this sounds a little bit like, like as perhaps a brag, but maybe it's just a beat. In fact, he said like, you have a better fish game than guys playing one case. Like, you do like your stats are just much better. You crush fish much harder. If you could just learn GTO, you fucking idiot, you could move up and play any stake you wanted. So is that actually a brag? I don't think so. It's a beat because I haven't put in the work to play where I should be playing. Yeah, everybody knows your fish game and everybody loves to study with you. And you, you've been coaching so many guys and there's a reason, reason for that. Yeah, yeah, like I have some skills. I just need to learn the other set of skills. Mind you, learning GTO, not exactly like sit down for five minutes and you're good, is it? It's like, you know, months and years <laughs> of study. So I've got that all ahead of me, but I'm pretty excited about it. No, that's good. Uh, you actually were the one who taught me that threes and sevens are burger steaks. And I, I when I <laughs> hit you up, I was playing threes and I was playing like, a lot of volume as well, and and then I turned up to you and you said like, "Oh, that's a burger steak. I will get you get you out of it like in a, in one session." And you actually did. And, <laughs> that's pretty and, awesome. Then. And afterwards, like a year later, I think I just joined uh, Evolve where we met again. But like, yeah, first you you taught, taught me about the burger steaks, and I thought, "Oh, yeah, okay, if if that's the case, then and I can make a living. I can get back mm -hmm. to Latvia. I was in the UK at the time." And yeah, thank you for that. Hey, a, a pleasure. Thank you. Like, uh, it, it, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, so many guys that I, I sort of worked with earlier, but now the tables have turned. They've got good, and I'm still stuck down at the 50s. So I need to do the work that you guys have done and come join you, hang out with you boys in the uh, the high stakes. That's the plan. See in the lobbies. See Jonas in the yeah. lobbies, too. <laughs> I'll be avoiding avoiding all you boys, don't you worry. But that's that's a little bit down, down the... Uh, that's a little bit in the future, but I'm I'm very excited about getting there. That's why I was so excited to come join 651, because I just see the incredible success that everybody has here and what a great community it is. So, 
yeah, I'm really keen on being a part of it. Like I was here in the past, but just getting staked and not really participating. And now I really want to participate. As you know, I recently joined as well, and I've been enjoying every month here. Yeah. My next question is uh, to do with your coaching. Because since mm -hmm. you have done like loads and loads of coaching and you have met so many people, uh, what are the funniest questions you have, you have been asked in the coaching session? <sighs> Honestly, hmm, that's a good question and I really don't know, but I'll tell you, because I coach so much, I try and make it fun for myself. And like some of my proudest moments is when we're coaching a Polish guy and then I got him to say, steal the pot like a Polish gypsy. And then as soon as he said it, we all turned in and said, oh, how could you say that? That's so wrong of you. <laughs> that was like one of my proudest moments. <laughs> that and all the terrible atrocious World War II jokes that I make <laughs> just to, like make the time more fun for myself I know everybody hates it but like you know I love coaching but when you coach like five hours a week sometimes it gets a bit old and you suffer a little bit and you know I share that suffering with everybody as a token of my love so <laughs> I make the coaching fun for myself and at least memorable for other people though I do you know Karim I know Karim, I was there for the Hitler jokes as well, but yeah, he, tell, tell he, everybody else. <laughs> uh, he, he didn't really appreciate it. He was like, Paul, like after after a while, it's like, you know, six million people dying isn't really that funny. Maybe you shouldn't joke about World War II. And I thought about it like, yes, you're right. And then, of course, being a dick, I just continued. So, <laughs> yeah, but he did have a very fair, fair point. I felt guilty for a few minutes there. Yeah, I think I was in, the, in that session as well. <laughs> and Fair point. Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, uh, Hitler jokes were good. And I know I, I made you tell one in stream as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a terrible sense of humor, I know. I do not, I, I don't consider myself like in any form like racist, like I, abhor that sort of thing. I just have a terrible sense of humor. I mean, I've lived in Asia for like 20 years and have like Asian wife and that sort of thing. Like I, I have zero racism in me. I just have this atrocious sense of humor. So I share it and everybody else suffers because of it, sadly. <laughs> I didn't suffer. I, I enjoyed it. And I didn't ever thought that's any kind of racism at all. No, I mean, it's just a bad sense of humor that sometimes goes a little bit too far. Uh, but I, I like to think that there could be some benefit because it makes things a little bit more memorable and people are going to remember some of the things that I say when they associate it with that sort of, that horrible sense of humor. So it could be like a, te a teaching technique as well. Yeah. Like you play on your strengths, right? Yeah, exactly. You have not only coached a lot of players online, but you lived with a couple of players and you met a lot of online players in, li in real life as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what, are, what are the funniest stories from there? <laughs> Our glorious leader, Wubble Pig, like right. he and uh, he and uh, Duckers, two of my favourite people. Wonderful. They came and stayed with me for a month in Bali, um, and they they literally like uh, like Wubs, great as he is, not a uh, great great soccer player, footballer, just in raw strength terms, Duckers can destroy him. Like, she's just physically so much stronger than he is. She's a freak of nature. So watching Bubs running around my swimming pool screaming as Duck has chased him down, just picked him up and threw him in the pool against his wishes. One of my fa fa favorite and most sort of glorious memories, just watching a grown man squeal like a stuck pig screaming around the... Like, leave me alone! No! No! And she just, she just like closed in on him, grabbed him like some sort of bird of prey and just like tossed him in the pool and there's nothing he could do. That was wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. And like having Mills and Maka stay with me, that was awesome. And then Mills would always hang out, hang out with my son, Ziggy. My son, Ziggy, I've got two children, like Slam and Ziggy. My son, Ziggy, is... Um, oh, he, he's pretty good now, but at the time he was like, he was just a complete dick. Like nobody liked him. I had to sit him down one day and say, look, 
if you're nice to people, you'll have friends. That's how it works. And that's why you don't have any friends. And he's like, really? That's it? And they're nice to people. But for the first 10 or 11 years, he was difficult. And like he and Mills just got on great. There's a great chemistry between them. And then one day Mills is hanging out with him in the pool and he says, Uncle Mills, why do you hang out with me? I'm 11. You're weird. <laughs> <Just like, laughs> completely owned Mills. And Mills is like, I was just trying to be nice, you dick. <laughs> like, yeah, no one gets to be nice to Ziggy and gets away with it. Not when he was young anyway. So that was funny. And uh, another, uh, another story is like, I had um, another two famous poker players that were staying with me and they were like sharing a room. And at the start they were like, well, there's only one bed in there. We'll just go buy beds. And then like after like a few weeks, I'm like, well, you guys buying beds? And they're like, you know what? We're kind of just enjoying like sleeping in the same bed. <laughs> so that always made me laugh. <laughs> so yeah, they, just, they were happy staying on the, on the, on the queen size bed. They said they had a separator between them, like a, a pillow or something, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> But yeah, like having, like meeting people, like a lot of poker players come to Bali and I get to hang out with them and meet them. And it's just like super awesome. I've never met a poker player I didn't like. So it's been really cool. That's cool. Yeah, we, we had a chat about that, that, that we we see screen names and we we have like our own thoughts about this, the other person or, or across the screen. And usually we think bad about those people. And when of we course. meet them, it's like, oh, you're actually a decent person. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I even met like a Polish reg the other day. Um, I did ask, he wanted like a small favor from me, like withdrawing money from him. I was like, are you in smart spin or not? And when he said no, I was like, yeah, right, fine. Um, like, yeah, I met, I was joking, but yeah, I met a, a Polish player. He was a lovely guy. Like, yeah, like everyone you meet in poker is lovely. I think um, the ego and the aggression and stuff, it's all on the table. In real life, everyone's cool. Yeah, yeah agreed. You don't you don't see the quote on on the screen, but you probably seen uh, there there are quotes in 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 every every podcast or interview. Yours is people will pull themselves into thinking they are better than they are despite evidence to the contrary, <laughs> and that's how yeah. your name that's, got out. Yeah, true story. Yeah, um, like it's one of the like two of the fallacies that we have as poker players. We all think that we're better than we are. Right, like because yeah. I guess that's just a sort of self confidence you need to play, and the other thing which is really weird, like not so much in the GTO era, but era, but like before that, everybody has this this fallacy where they think other players think the same way that they think. So it's like, oh, this is not going to work because it wouldn't work against me, or he's or he's bluffing me. I, I've got like people that I coach that are sure that they're getting bluffed all of the time because they're always trying to bluff other players all of the time. They think everyone else is doing the same thing that they're doing, but. It's a, it's a fallacy. You have to be able to put yourself in the shoes of other players. And one of the reasons that I'm good against fish is because I know how fish think. I can, I can literally think like a fish. And that's how it's like a, a form of empathy. That's why I'm good against them. It's not because I have any technical skills or anything like that. I simply understand like fish thinking, which is maybe a beat. But yeah, I do. So yeah, it's like th they're common fallacies that we have as poker players, I think. Yeah, I really enjoy studying uh, cognitive biases, and we have like tons of them. And we, we think we are yeah. smart, but we are so far from this. <laughs> and we are so it's biased true. of everything. And yeah, and your your screen name is one of the best I have seen, apart from like trolling ones. You yours is yeah, the best yeah. one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean it's it's kind of cool. There's a lot of dissonance in poker, right? Yeah, for so, sure, for sure. Yeah. All right. What is your definition of success? That's a good question. Um, when I grew up, I was I, I was born in the seventies, like seventy one. That seems like ridiculously long time ago, and it was. It is, but like it was the hippie era. Like success was not uh, based on money. It was based on relationships and self development and being a cool person, and that kind of rubbed off on me that I don't necessarily see success as having like X amount of dollars in the bank. And the reason for that is I know plenty of people that have a lot of money or win a lot of money, or make a lot of money, and it's never enough for them. And they just have to continue down that path of chasing money. And they do it so obsessively that in the end, 
like where did their life go and like what was the point of it all? And if you look at like successful businessmen, sure, making money is definitely a good thing. Like you can do more things with money than not with money. But let's say that you have ten million dollars. Can you can you really do more things if you have a billion dollars or five billion dollars? Are you really likely to do more things? It's enough to eat forever. It's enough to go on holidays, to buy nice houses and nice cars, to look after your family. Like. Yes, you need a certain amount of money, but like having obscene amounts of money, I don't believe makes you any happier. Yeah, there is. I, I have seen uh, a correlation. Somebody tried to show it's like up to the one point, the happiness and money goes along, and then it just drops off. Like it's it's, yeah. it's just and, and and even like maybe like having a couple of million is better than more because you got scared about it's it's being mm. a scarcity afterwards. Yeah, you're worried you're going to lose it, yeah. So, yeah, yeah what, what's my definition of, of success? Uh, like being a good person, having a family that loves you, like raising good children, uh, having friends, though I need more friends, having friends, like all of that stuff I consider, like living a, living a life that you can be proud of where you haven't done shitty things to people. Like that's what I consider a successful person. Having good health, I mean, obviously you can't always control that, but like... That's also part of it. Like once your health isn't there, then like everything else becomes unimportant to you. So yeah, be being healthy and and having like good relationships with the people, and of course also to a certain extent having a little bit of money so that you're not under money stress. That is part of being successful. But not having like ten million dollars. A person that had like ten million dollars and wasn't happy, I wouldn't consider him successful. A person that had like enough to get by but was a very happy person and like connected to his community. I would consider him successful. That's when I look at your Facebook, I'm always seeing like you in a in a beautiful location in your home, I assume, like a beautiful location in the countryside and friends and family coming over and you having a great time. I consider you a successful person. Thank you. Yeah, I consider myself a success, successful person as well. <laughs> yeah. It's to some extent. But yeah, yeah. I, I like your definition and I definitely agree it's not only money for sure. Uh, I heard that the, you don't believe in things. You don't believe in anything. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, like, I, I have never had any spiritual beliefs. I've always tried to be a, a good person and not do shitty things to other people, but not because I think there's someone in the sky looking down on me who's going to judge me. I mean, it just has always seemed ridiculous to me. I have officially been many, well not many, but a few different religions. And the reason I'm okay, like, technically now I'm a Muslim, right? Um, yeah. And the reason that I'm okay with that is because I don't believe in any of it. Just like I don't really believe in marriage, so I don't care if I'm married or if I'm not married. Like if you really don't believe in an institution, you wouldn't care if you're inside or outside of that institution because you have no, it doesn't affect you. Whereas if I really was religious, I would care if I was technically a Muslim or a Christian or a Catholic or whatever. So, yeah, I, I have no, no beliefs. I've just never felt it inside me. I have complete respect for people that do. Like my brother is extremely religious and runs a religious charity here in Bali and devotes his entire life to it. So he's like, and, and like constantly posts Facebook posts uh, Facebook posts that are quotes from the Bible. He prays before he eats, like goes to church, preaches at the church. He's the most religious, but well, one of the most religious people you meet. I'm the exact opposite. Like to me, it just makes zero sense. And I have no internal feeling, but I, but, but the people that, that do believe, I think they're in a nice position because they get a lot of uh, comfort from it. Which I, which I don't get. Like, I, like when, when people say, like, what happens after you die? I'm like, what happens when your body and mind stops functioning? Well, like, it stops fun functioning and that's it. You're gone. Like, that's how I think things are. So, the, like, the, the, the word death sort of defines what happens. You're dead. There's nothing else. It'd be nice if I was wrong, but, like, yeah, I, I feel nothing spiritual whatsoever. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's, that's cool with me, too. <laughs> Yeah, one one of the things like whenever people are confused with the death and can't imagine that, I I say like every night you go to sleep and you're not dead, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like 
what is there to fear? Like you're no longer there to fear it. So there's not like, for the people that are left behind, it can be bad because obviously they're traumatized that you're gone. If you have a painful death process where you get sick, that's horrific. That's a fucking nightmare. Absolutely. That's something to fear because you're going to go through a lot of pain and discomfort. That would be horrible. But like actually being dead, it's all over. You've got nothing to worry about. Yep. Agree. Nobody knows anyway, so decide your own version and stick with it. <laughs> yeah. What, what gets me is always if you think about human history, there's probably been 10,000 different religions. Maybe that's, a, that's too high a number, maybe 4,000. But there, there's been thousands of different religions. And the one arrogant belief that they all have is that their, their religion is the correct one. Right? And that doesn't really make any sense to me. Like, what are the odds out of those 10,000 religions that yours is actually the right one? You know, I guess it's 10,000 to one. Like, that's kind of an arrogant belief. It's also arrogant to say that you know there is no God. Of course, I can't know that. But, like, I don't feel anything. And if there was a God and he wouldn't let me into heaven just because I didn't believe in him, what an arrogant man. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that's what's wrong with Christianity, right? <laughs> So, yeah. Anyway, let's, let's not get too deep into it and offend anyone. But like, yeah, it's, it's not for me. All right, yeah, yeah. But we are free to have our opinion, right? Of what the future, what the future holds for you? You mentioned getting into GTO lab, but outside that, um, I I got divorced a few years ago, and I'm with a new woman who drives me nuts, but we have a strong relationship. She wants to get married, and I said to her in the most romantic possible way, I don't want to get married. I fucking hate being married, but if it makes you happy, whatever. I'll do whatever makes you happy. So that could be in the future. She was like, really? That's the nicest thing you can say? I was like, yeah, that's it. Like, <laughs> so that could be happening in the future. Um, I'm like, I don't know. Um, I'm going to stay in Bali. That's really important to me because I love this island. Even though I'm not a spiritual person, it's one of those most spiritual places on earth and I just like the vibe here. So I'm going to stay here. I'm going to hopefully make a bunch of money by moving up and get some sort of financial freedom going on. Um, I'm not going to have any more children. Like my, my children are now grown up and I'm done with that. Like that's one thing I'm very firm on. That's pretty much one of the few things. But yeah, that, that's the future. Like I hopefully getting some sort of financial freedom through poker um, and then like, you know, chilling out and also not dying soon. Like hopefully medicine will like sort of evolve that the great leap in people's lifespans, which is coming at some stage, hopefully I'll catch that and not be too late. That would be really cool. I'd love to live to like 100, 150, 200. I would be one of the best people to ever do it because like I'm always happy and I have like some terrible short term memory where I could just have Groundhog Day every day where the same shit happens and I wouldn't remember and I'd just be happy about it. So I can wake up, eat the same food, do the same shit, go for a walk on the beach and be super happy and do the same thing the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. I can do that for years. So I'd be perfect to live for a long time. <laughs> so now hopefully somebody hears or nobody should hear that. <laughs> well, you know. Help me out, boys. If you've got any wonderful drugs that will keep us alive, I'm on for it. Speaking of, like, wonderful drugs, Oscars, do you take metformin? Do you know what that is? Uh, no. So there's a famous uh, PhD from Australia, uh, Dr. David Sinclair, who does research into longevity, and he recommends that all people take metformin. It's a diabetes drug, but it does good things to your body and your cells and helps you live longer. So would recommend that you check that out, by the way, and then anyone else that listens to this. Yeah, we'll definitely check check that out, and yeah, I need to find it first. Yeah, it's super cheap, by the way. Okay, but it's good, cheap and good. Well, that's what we want. That I mean, it it supposedly does good things. I can't notice any difference, but it's like, how do you notice that you're not aging faster than you should? Like that's kind of hard to tell, right? Yeah, impossible. So, do you know my special question? No, what is it? I, I, I've forgotten what your special question is. Fire away. Okay. If your story would end in 15 minutes, I know you don't want it, but if it would end in 15 minutes, what would be a title of it? And one to three sentence description. Oh, I do remember this from Jonas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, let me think. If my, what would be the title of my life? Um, I, maybe, perhaps. One of my friends described me as an anarchist because all my life I've done my best to live outside of the system. Like when I was in Australia, I was on unemployment benefits and I never really worked. And then I got a job teaching and then got out of it as soon as I could and then didn't really work to play poker. So I've, I've tried to stay outside of the system and outside of society as much as I can. Like a lot of people who live in Bali, they form connections with other Westerners and they have this big social network that they sort of cling to. I don't have that. Like I'm basically, I try to stay outside of as many systems as I can because my personal happiness comes from inside me. It doesn't come from outside influences. It's not really other people. It's not money. It's just like, it, I just have this stupid, insane happiness inside me where to, to even my girlfriend thinks I'm weird because like, why don't you have more friends? Why don't you hang out with people? Like there are people here on the island who are my friends, but I wouldn't talk to them or see them from like, you know, month to month. But then if they contact me, I'm like, oh, hey, it's great to see you. I'm always happy to see them, but I don't really need to be around other people very much. So I guess if we had a title, it'd be something like, you know, like, like a tyrannicist or someone who lived outside of the system. That's the gist of it. That's, that's the sort of person that I am. And that's like my, my true being. So what is the exact title? I will need to type it then. You know, I'm not a native um, speaker. <laughs> let me think. Uh, like, let me see. A genuine anarchist. Genuine perhaps. anarchist. Yeah, someone who doesn't believe really in rules and structures. I mean, it's an explanation. And, and it's like wanted to always live outside of the system. That's who I am. Sounds good. If you, if you listen to the previous ones, everyone tried to go with the catchy ones, catchy names. and you. I know. Yeah, I know. Fuck it. That's just who I am. But you got a good one. Like, I would be interested to look into that one as well. Okay. Okay. What are the final, final messages you would words. like to, to send to Jim? To have some perspective. Like, life is long and hopefully good for everybody. And like the fact that you had pocket queens and the other guy hit a king on the river or the fact that you lost $5,000 in EV today or made $5,000, it's not going to mean anything in the end, right? Like to, we all get obsessed with the destination. I want to make this amount of money. I want to be successful. I want to do this. It's the journey that counts, right? And like in the end, the, the, the disagreements you have with other people, the happiness and sadness, none of it is going to matter. So try and enjoy the journey and give yourself as much pleasure and other people as much pleasure as you can because none of the, nothing else will matter. Like you can't take the money with you. You can't take anything with you. And if you have any anger or dislike of other people, forgive them as a gift to yourself to make your journey more pleasant. That's a fucking beautiful message. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, mate. Yeah, really good one. Yeah, thank you for coming, and I hope other people will. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope other people will enjoy it as much as I did. I had a great time. You know, I love to talk about myself. Thank you for having me on here, mate. Really enjoyed it. All right. Cheers. Cheers. All right, we're out. <laughs>